I'm Roy Firestone, and this is GOATS, the greatest Miami Hurricanes of all time, and this is part two of our interview with the new coach of the Miami Hurricanes, Mario Cristobal. And when we speak of the greatest of all time, in coaching certainly, the name Don Shula must be mentioned. He was the winningest pro football coach of all time, a Miami legend coach, back-to-back -back world championships starting more than 50 years ago, and Mario was just a little boy when Don led his teams to that greatness. I asked Mario if he in any way likened Shula to his story. You know, I grew up in Miami. I'm a little older than you, maybe quite a bit older than you. And I remember in 1970, we had a coach by the name of Don Shula come to Miami. He was 40 years old. You're 52. But it was, it's a similar story to me. I'm, I'm putting I'm put words in your mouth. This is how I feel. You remind me a little bit of Don and how he converted a program that had a, a, obviously a professional team that had pretty good talent, but he turned it all around. Was he an inspiration to you? I know you had met him. Luis had met him too at another time. Was he in any way an influence or an inspiration? You were just a little kid when he was really, really going great. But talk about Don Shula. Do you think there's any parallels? Oh, I, I can't ever, and I would not ever compare myself to someone of that magnitude that he is the essence of greatness as it relates to coaching and community. I, uh, back then growing up, there were three coaches in this world. There was Don Shula, there was Tom Landry and Chuck Knoll. Okay. And that was it. All right. I was a Steeler fan, but I still loved Don Shula and, um, you know, his, his sons went to Columbus high school, you know, where we went to high school as well. So, his, his management style, his coaching style, his ability to over the years evolve as well. I, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find a better example of coaching and a Miami icon like Don Shula. So I, I did not deserve to be mentioned in the same breath as him. Um, but I certainly, uh, I hope that uh, I can honor him and those that I've coached before at Miami, whether it be the Dolphins or the Hurricanes, in the way that we conduct ourselves and the way that we perform on and off the field. Very well said. Hey, we got a, a clip from a player you have a great regard for. One of the most passionate players I think I've ever been around in sports, really. Here's Michael Irvin. I know Mario Cristobal, is a, he's a great coach, a great motivator, and he is, he's family. Mm -hmm. So we, we keep talking about how to get back to where we were Years and years ago, and, and, and finding that, that, that hurricane way, and, and, and Mario Cristobal can be one of those guys that help us get back there. I'm so happy with this hire. Uh, he's a great friend of mine. I haven't talked to him in a while, and I will, I will be reaching out to him here this week now to congratulate him and talk to him. But, but I think this is a great, great opportunity for Miami. And, and for the first time, Miami got <clears throat> aggressive about going after who they wanted, yep. and, and, and I'm pretty sure they had to put some money on the board. <laughs> I don't know how important money is to you, but how important is an electric presence like a Michael Irvin to a program? It's priceless. <laughs> <laughs> That's the right answer. That's the right yeah. answer. No, he was here for Legends Camp. Michael Irvin doesn't remember, but on my official visit, I my encounter with, with him was as simple as I thought I was going to get recruited, but instead he literally walked up to me, got just about nose to nose and said, <laughs> you don't want to come here? The heck with you. Get your bleep the heck out of here, okay? And go somewhere else. We'll kick your butt all over the place. Wow. Are you with us or you're against us? I'm like, damn, okay. I'm with <laughs> you. So, no, he um, he came out here and he, uh, he coached the Legends camp and spoke at it. And, the I mean, he still looks like he should be playing. You know, that's <laughs> the first thing that stands out. And then – his passion for the University of Miami, his presence, his tone, the way he speaks, his message is very powerful, very, very powerful. And then all the guys that play with him were here as well, so that adds to it. And he, uh, he's a special, special guy, man. I mean, this guy, he just helped the trajectory of Miami go this way, did the same for the Cowboys in the NFL. So obviously an honor to have a guy like that back again. Um, you know, we, we look at this now, and it's so different from what it was when you were first recruited. I have a shot of you as a player. Kind of a hypothetical question. Would Mario Cristobal, the player, be recruited by Mario Cristobal, the coach? 
well, if I couldn't find anybody else, maybe. <laughs> right. You know, the guys I'm recruiting are right now are a lot bigger, stronger, and faster. You know, the guy in that picture is a guy that uh, found a way to make it on just effort, toughness, and resiliency, and just refusing to lose. Now, I would I would recruit that mentality all day. You know, I, I really, really would, but. Um, I think our, our linemen look a lot better than that. I don't know if that guy squats what these guys are squatting. <laughs> um, Kerb Herb Street, Herb Street last year made a comment at, that went national. And a lot of people think that what he said fired up the Miami, woke, woke them up, the Miami administration, the president, athletic director, all the people. And they said, we, we better pay attention to this. I'm going to play this clip and have you talk about what he said about Miami has to put up or shut up financially. Watch. Miami has averaged seven and five since 2006. They've had five head coaches. You just think about with the Orange Bowl gone, the student body has to drive 45 minutes to go to their games. You have an athletic department that clearly is not really showing that this is something that they are willing to try to make changes. The president, there was an article from Barry Jackson this week that came out, said that the president basically told Blake James, the AD, hey, sports, you're on your own. That's your thing. I don't know if that's true. It was in an article. To me, college football, you look at the powerhouse programs, Alabama, out, Clemson, Ohio State, president, AD, head coach, same vision have all the same, they're aligned in their vision for what needs to happen, recruiting, budget, staff, whatever it need, means, that's what it takes. Miami doesn't have that. Well, they do now. And I want to ask you if you felt that there was an assurance needed from them for you to sign to be the Kane coach, to have everybody aligned. 100%. Mm -hmm. well, there was no move without that alignment. Can't be successful. And you can't make up the ground that Miami had to make up without being in complete alignment with the powers that be. So that's the part that makes it uh, exciting, uh, reassuring, um, is knowing that that it's real. It's not talk. It's not a promise. It's not, hey, we're thinking about this or that or we're going to. It's, it's what it is. And that's what makes Miami, I think, in the eyes of everybody, a very, a very dangerous program, you know, that's, that moves and is moving very fast. Things have really changed, though, in, in the climate of coaching and recruiting, even in the last couple of years. You have the, the portal and you have the NIL. Coach Rick talked to us about how the name, image, and likeness issue has really changed everything. Some say for the better, some say for the players, for sure, but maybe not so much the coaches. Here's Coach Rick. The problem, I, I think the biggest problem with the NIL right now is the fact that there are no limitations to it. And I don't think there ever will be limitations to it. I think certain states handle it one way, another state handles it, handles it another way. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's hard to get your arms around it because the thing of it is, once you allow the, the, those guys to make money, you can't restrict their earnings. It's, it's against the law to do that. So that's why it's into the millions of dollars. And I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. So, Well, you're going to have a situation someday, if not right now, where some players are making more money with NIL than some of their assistant coaches. Oh, yeah, that's already happening. There, there's yeah. no doubt about that. And, you know, everybody's got to learn to live with it. I mean, bottom line is you're getting what the market's going to bear. You know, if, if you're if the market says the assistant coach makes 350000 a year and and the kid makes a million a year, that's, that's life. Wow. You're concerned in any way about what's happening with the NIL and, some, and somewhat with the portal too? I'm not with NIL. Uh, I think it's, it all falls under your constitutional rights. And I think eventually it'll get figured out where there's more order to it and where there's more clarity on how to proceed. I think that's more the concern than anything else. In terms of constitutional rights, those things are what they are. They always have been. Now they just finally found a way to bring it to light. There's just, I feel like there's no, um, I don't know if guardrails is the right term to use, but it feels like it just needs more clarity and more order, you know? In terms of the transfer portal, you know, it uh, when used for the right reasons, I think it's great. 
when it's not, then it's not, which is like anything else in this world. I, I know that we haven't changed a lick about the way we coach due to a transfer portal because people ask that all the time. You got to change the way you coach. You got to no. Why? Why would you have to change the way you coach? The only way you'd have to change is if you weren't doing it right to begin with. Mm. In my opinion, that's as, as clear as a day is long. If you're changing now because you're worried someone might not like the way you're coaching, you weren't coaching right to begin with. You mm. know, I mean, don't change your discipline. Don't change your criteria. Don't change your, your demands and certainly don't change your standards. I mean, yeah. and so come on, man. You know, I, uh, I get it. There's some things that don't make sense and things are moving fast and it's, it's all over the place, but that's part of football. It's part of sudden change. We keep telling athletes all the time, Hey, you know, you got to get better this off season. Hey, if in the middle of the game, we lose the ball, you got to get back at it. Well, now as coaches and supposedly adults, there's sudden change. Well, let's adapt, right? Mm. Let's make it work for the best of everybody. Mm. I know one player, if he were active today at 20 or 19 or 18 years old, you would have loved to have had, he was the great Chuck Foreman. Chuck played wide receiver and running back and DB all at Miami, which is hard to believe. I asked him this, you'll get a kick out of this, what he thinks he'd be worth with the NIL these days. What would you have been worth now, Chuck Foreman, with the name, image, and likeness now at Miami? Well, they'd probably had to have at least a couple of mil. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about a hundred thousand because I might have to, all the different things that I would do. But but that but that in mind and NIL, I think it's a great thing. But boy, they need to figure out a way to make sure they educate these young fellows about money, taxes. You know, family's going to come wanting to hold on and get some of it. Uh, you're going to have the ladies coming. You're going to have uh, all that other stuff out there with it when it has money. This, you know, I mean, I'm glad they're getting it. And then they're going to have to let, teach them how to structure it. Is that a school's issue? Is it their responsibility to educate these kids and to watch these kids financially? I mean, it's, it becomes a really big big you know, tarnished ball there of all kinds of issues. Is that the school's responsibility? I think that part of it is, I think a big part of it is, I really do. We know we have the term financial literacy is often thrown out there. Well, what does that really mean? Right? Cause it's, it's a fancy term that people maybe just throw out there to say that they're doing the right things by uh, their guys, but what are they really doing? And, you know, we are, we have an umbrella of, protection as it relates to taxes, to education for our guys regarding NIL and just financial uh, opportunities in general. In fact, one of the one of the neat things we have is every Thursday of the past four or five weeks, John Vilma has come in, who's John Vilma's the epitome of self-made, right? Two-star guy, came to camp, 186 pounds, ran four nine, only went out there and kicked everybody's butt, became a starter and a first round pick, right? An all-pro player. But he's also, he's brilliant, especially as it relates to the financial world. And he conducts like financial literacy courses with our team and our coaching staff present on Thursday, Thursday nights. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's part of like our, our, our real life educational pieces that we introduce our players to. So, uh, but, and I think that's our responsibility because again, they're being introduced to something that they've never had access to. It can go sideways if they don't have their guardrails. So we try to provide that for them. Mm -hmm. Mario, I want to talk. You don't want to talk money for a young player who's still in college, but there is talk that that Tyler Van Dyke is going to eventually, maybe after the, this year, maybe turn pro, and there'll be maybe a potload of money at some point. But I don't want to talk the money specifically. I want to talk the talent and the gifts. Let's look at the clips, and I want to ask you if you can compare him anyway to Justin Herbert, who you had at Oregon. Well, I think, I think it's always dicey comparing guys. You know what I mean? I think uh, you could talk great quarterbacks. You know, there's a lot of traits there that are very similar, no question. Um, and you're looking at guys in different stages in their career when uh, upon arrival. But what I can say about Tyler Van Dyke, I think he's as good as there is in the country. And, and I say that for a couple of reasons. Number one, quarterbacks need a commanding presence. He has that. It's strong. He has complete control and knowledge of the scheme itself. So in other words, if he's at the line of scrimmage, he knows that there's a guy on that should be off. He can immediately fix it. 
uh, a guy that's taken the improper split, a guy that uh, is kind of confused or there's movement up front and pieces are changing where the old line has to make a check or he has to redirect the protection. He has that ability, which is awesome. He understands pre post snap reads like this. There's no hesitation in this game. He's a great decision maker. Throws a great ball. He's accurate, strong arm, can make the touch passes, uh, understands the run game, understands leverage, angles, all that stuff. This guy is an absolute stud. Do you think Herbert is a good parallel or is it, are they different types of players? I mean, there's some qualities, yes, but is, is it an unfair comparison in any way? I think it's unfair because you got a guy now that's, you know, you know, when we were uh, when we were at Oregon, um, Justin was coming off of his freshman year. Then he got injured his sophomore year, you know, and um, we were rebuilding a program. There was a lot of young pieces around them. Right. And the best way to make a quarterback good is make the supporting cast really, really good. So and right now, obviously, Justin is, is arguably one of the best players in the NFL. So I'd hate to compare a guy that's already achieved that in mm-hmm. terms of do you see similar traits? Absolutely. You do. You know, all the great quarterbacks seem to have those things in common. And certainly, you know, Tyler is well on his way to being a great one. Mm. Just a few more minutes, coach. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, After your playing uh, career ended, you went through a two-year application process to become a U.S. Secret Service agent. You were offered the job in 1998, and you actually accepted the job briefly. Um, Then you changed your mind. Um, It was very interesting because I was talking to Luis about it. He said, you know, I wanted to be a Secret Service guy. And so when I saw Mario was actually getting the green light, I felt like it was he was almost representing my dreams in a little bit. But we put a Photoshop together of what it would have looked like if you were a Secret Service agent. There you are. How would have life been different if you were a Secret Service agent? Well, probably the same haircut, right? So, <laughs> I, I loved I loved the uh, idea of federal work and law enforcement. Um, and your brother, for those who don't know, your brother is with the Miami Dade Police Department, Dade County. So yes, he's he's 30, in it. Yep. Yeah, 30 years. So I always loved the idea. You know, I always had family in law enforcement or in the military. And it just it was natural. It felt good. And I felt like there was a great career in it. And my good friend was already in there. And um, I fell in love with coaching. I didn't I thought it would I thought coaching as a graduate assistant would be a stopgap. You know, find a way, yeah, you get your master's diploma, you know, help the Miami Hurricanes get better. And it didn't take long. I, I fell in love with it right away. And when, when the opportunity came, I took it. But that night I slept on it or halfway slept on it, maybe a half an hour worth. And I just, I did not want to, I did not want to live without football. That's the best way to put it. I had been cut by the Denver Broncos as a rookie in camp. Went to NFL Europe, and then I got after a couple of years that football was over. I'm like, man, God, I really miss football. Now I had football again in my life. I wasn't, I just wasn't willing to let it go. Mm. One of the great loves when you were a kid with your brother Luis was professional wrestling. Your father would take you on Friday nights to the beach auditorium to see guys like Dusty Rhodes and all those great wrestlers. We did another mock-up for you if, in another life if you had been a pro wrestler. So what do you think of that? Do you think that that, that would have been a dream for you to be a professional like The Rock? I think it'd be a dream to just have ads like that. You know, never <laughs> So uh, we loved it, man. You know, we were all about, you know, it used to be Florida wrestling, championship wrestling. Gordon Soley was the announcer, the best. Yeah, the best. I remember. Mm-hmm. Dusty Rhodes, Sweet Brown Sugar, Bugsy McGraw, Harley Race, all those cats. So the, the Funk Brothers, the, the Briscoe Brothers. We loved Jack, it. That was Jack, pretty- Jack Briscoe was one. I remember Jack, right? Jack and Jerry Briscoe against Jerry, Jerry Briscoe. And Funk. Absolutely. And then, and we'd be, you know, Bobo Brazil was a big one. Andre the Giant was, you know, coming around. And then the Purple Haze, Kevin Sullivan, all those guys. But <laughs> our seats were like way up in the rafters. You know? So but we got to, what a treat, man. God, if we ever got, whenever we got tickets to, to going down the Miami Beach Convention Center, oh my Lord, man, that was like the end all be all of existence as a kid. 
And, and the funny thing is, full circle, your teammate becomes the biggest star in wrestling in The Rock Johnson before he became the biggest star in Hollywood. That's so funny and ironic to me. I asked, I asked Luis about the two of you, this our final little clip here, about the fact that everybody thinks, oh, they were like bonded the whole way through. These guys were super close, super loving. And he said, it's not really the case because of the competition. I want you to listen to this. And he also talks about your wrestling matches with him. Watch. You know, we really didn't get along uh, up until like after I left the college. Really? Yeah, we that really more, did. That, that more re that recently. Wow. Yeah. I left the college. It's like, you know, I, I was actually thinking about this a couple of days ago because, you know, you, as you get older, you reflect and stuff and, and when I, when I left the college, I guess I kind of missed them, you know, I guess I kind of missed them, even though it was right down the street, but, but still, you're not living with them like every day. And, and I think our, our issues just came from just competitiveness. I mean, just at everything from, from shooting baskets in the backyard to how you butter your toast. I mean, hmm. it was everything, dude. And, uh, and uh, yeah, there were quite, uh, quite a few fist fights to say the least. I'm certainly not uh, uh, condoning this for like current players. You know, but it was kind of a famous thing on Friday nights at team hotels, the wrestling match, the, the matches that Mario and I would would have and, and people <laughs> just a lot. And it was just funny. It was just funny. You remember those Friday nights, I take it. Oh, yeah. And I swear I couldn't stand the guy. I swear to God, I, I was like, man, I remember I remember actually going on National Sign Day, watching him sign with Miami and just telling myself, you know what? I'm not going to Miami now. I'm going to go to Michigan. I'm going to go kick his butt. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and uh, and it was. It was out of competitiveness. And there were, you know, yeah, it got physical. But, I mean, we were physical guys, man. We went to Columbus High School. We were coached by the best coaches ever. Those guys are my favorite guys. And um, But I did come out to practice, and I watched him get after and grind. And we started talking. We're like, all right, you know, maybe we should think about playing together. And I remember my dad, you know, big cigar in his mouth, you know, started looking at both of us, you know, he almost with his eyes told us, I'm going to kick both your butts. <laughs> hey, we're just about out of time. Uh, I just want you to reflect on one final question. It's really about love. I mean, it's about the love of work, but you love what this is. You love the whole process. You love the job, but what's good finally about coaching what's good about doing what you do for a living beyond your own personal love for the craft i think it's the greatest form of education that i had coming up I, the class on the grass as my coach used to call it was the most impactful or were the most impactful moments that we had you got into conversations and lessons that were learned that i don't think a classroom or a retreat could have ever taught those things. I mean, you were pushed to the point where you wanted to quit, but no one would let you quit. Mm. And you found that, you know what, maybe you didn't have limits. Maybe improvement was a real thing as long as you're willing to put in time. And then you also learned that it wasn't for everybody. And that's a good thing too, because then you realize, okay, I, I can outlast, you know, and I could align myself with people that are like-minded and we can go kick ass together. Mm -hmm. they, oh, I mean, coaching and people that are coaches, anyone that are, that's, that's good for young people. I love, I love people that truly invest and care about being good for young people. And I mean, not just helping them get better at, you know, tackling and running routes or whatnot, but that can affect them here and in here. Those are, that changes things, man. It's, the last pit stop before real life. We're it. We're the last stop. After this, what do we have now? We have these, what are these cane cards, right? That you swipe and you get your, your meal for free. Your dorm is paid for. Um, your scholarship is good, whether you had a good day or a bad day. But we got to prepare for when that cane card is just like a, an ornament that you had during college where now it's a credit card. You better pay the bill on that. You're going to get hit by, right, by uh by what's going to be on there at the end of the month and that people are no longer going to care about how many touchdowns you scored or how many sacks you had and the resiliency that comes with playing football and being in tough moments 
the learning that you that you get from from the losses as much as the wins from winning a position to having a bad injury and having to overcome it only to have another one and have someone else take your spot but you got to come back and work hard to take it come on man you can't you can't talk about that you can't put it on an overhead or drill it or read it and bubble it up on a multiple choice test you've got to experience it and that's what this is all about boy that is about as good a description of why it matters why this is a good job and does good things for young people as well as the coaches themselves. I mean, it's just an extremely thoughtful, articulate, reflective look on all of it. Mario, we took too much of your time. I apologize to your sports information director. I know you probably have a recruit waiting in the wings. I want to thank you and I want to wish you the very best of luck in 2022 and beyond. Uh, It was a great pleasure and a great honor to have you on the show. Thank you. Appreciate you. Go Canes always, brother. Thanks, Mario. That's Mario Cristobal, who was a player, twice an all-conference selection, played on two national championship teams, a graduate assistant coach, an assistant coach, and now head coach, some five or six stops, I guess, at Miami, on his way to becoming the man who hopes to lead the Canes, not just to relevancy, but we hope, we think, greatness, too. Hope you've enjoyed our part two interview with Mario Cristobal. Thanks for watching GOATS, the greatest Canes of all time, and we'll see you next time.